What's going on, YouTube? Rukar here, back with another episode of the Minotaur Hotel, and this time we're with an entirely different Minotaur named Storm, and our peacock friend P, as we try to come up with a uh, ritual so that Storm here can live amongst the mortals more comfortably. The peacock knows that an oath is a tenuous thing given power by the relation of one thing to another. A complete thought to its dependent claws, subject to an object, a bird, to a minotaur. What inconsequential fluff can he reveal to connect with this storm, this boy who holds the secret to his deepest wish under lock and key? An authoritative flick of a wing suffices to get the bull's attention, to make the wheels and the pair's heads screech to a grinding halt. Since you'll be working for me, I'll begin with the one story you need to know. Where to start? You ever see anything supernatural over here, Storm? We're sticking with the British accent. It's the only voice I've got for him. The Minotaur looks away, to the roads beyond sight. That tells the peacock what he really wants to know. Plenty of weird stuff happens here, but I don't know if it's magic or what. The peacock rolls his eyes. The brat tenses up as though walking a tightrope and floundering for balance. In that moment, he understands better than ever before what it is to be under a hierarchy. He knows that he must take care not to offend his new benefactor or risk losing his chance at humanity. Whatever his feelings, he must agree to anything the peacock to anything the peacock says. Ah, I hiccuped. Yeah, yeah. This place is supposed to be the last hole where one can find magic in this side of the country. Radio, television, the internet, wherever those go, the weaker the magic becomes. We don't know why, but it is what it is. And this place, the Hinterlands, by virtue of how big a shithole it is, kept itself free of all sorts of progress and basic civilization. Oh, sorry, I hope I didn't offend you for... <clears throat> Nah, I hate it here. People always treated me like shit. There's no jobs except for mine and salt, and they won't even take me for that. Nothing to do, nothing to see, nothing worth saving in this hole. The peacock smiles through the natural curvature of his beak. Storm's tacit admission stirs the breeze in his lungs until it emerges as a billowing, prideful snort. I'm glad we agree with each other. Well, with that in mind, our story begins 80 or so years ago. I suppose it was a night much like this one, when someone much like me, that's my grandfather, ran away from this place. He lived most of his life here, and I don't know the details, but things went south and he found himself having to run for his life. He ran as far as he could, and then spent three days in the wilderness, hiding during the day and trekking towards the coastline during the night. On the fourth night, he met a traveler who gave him food and water. Nice man, I imagine. Sees someone running away and doesn't ask any questions, just offers help. Might have known he was better off not knowing. The wanderer, however, knew how to read the stars and gave Grandpa a few words of advice. Go northwest, you'll be safe there. But Grandpa didn't follow his advice. He heard stampeding horses from that direction, so he went to the east, and there he found... a bus station. It was the middle of the night, and there was no one there. He checked the schedule. Perhaps a bus would come, take him northwest. Not five minutes later, one showed up. The driver was a creature disguised as a human. He didn't speak Portuguese, and his clothes had strange lettering. Grandpa boarded, and they set off eastward, and he was taken to a strange place he called the Minotaur Hotel. He told me it was created before the Tower of Babel was destroyed, that a fragment of its old human magic survived there, making it so all could understand each other regardless of language. The place was governed by a Minotaur who had the power to make diamonds appear in the palm of his hand. No one went hungry there, even the most wretched person could find a home and a job. But, as you can guess, something happened. Grandpa came back home all messed up one day and then set off to find that hotel again. But he never did. Spent years searching, went back to his job, met his wife, had his kid, but never stopped going out for days at a time to try and find the place. 
Pa thinks he was crazy that this hotel never existed. Grandma's still around and still resents every night Grandpa spent on the search. As for Gramps, it's been a few weeks since he passed on. I'd like to say he told me the story again on his deathbed and asked me to find it, that hotel. Now wouldn't that be grand? But that would be a lie. A sweet one, but a lie nonetheless. I wasn't there when he died, and by that time his mind had been gone for a long while. I like to think he felt some freedom when his time came. But I suppose one can never be freed without passing on a burden to another. Now that he's gone, that old wanderlust has taken me over. I want to find that hotel. Clear my grandpa's name, prove he was right all along. A resolute, a resolute look plays across the avian's features. If there was vulnerability in his speech, it's been thrice folded and stashed in the corner of his mind. From where he stands, Storm can't help but notice how put together and proper everything about the peacock is. Plus, there's something over there that's mine. My inheritance, you could call it. I've been having dreams about this place ever since Gramps passed on. I'm sure everything he said was true. Now it's your turn. Tell me a story. The Minotaur's eyes grow as thin as knives. Do I really have to? No story, no charm, no human. What if I come up with something? Does it have to be true? Sure, go ahead and waste our time. I'm not doing this again, however. The Minotaur looks away, this time towards the pond and his hole. He knows there is no choice, but he can't speak. Not while the hummingbirds are pecking away at the back of his head, raising each strand of fur. He scratches his neck with both hands, digging in to make the skin red raw, but the peacock ignores it. His patience grows thin. Will you really force me to interrogate you, lad? The Minotaur shakes his head, trying to swat away all the critters flying around him. A grave moo escapes from his throat. How old are you? Twenty-one. Just, just give me a minute. I'm thinking, okay? The peacock counts the seconds while the minotaur loses sense of time. He keeps on scratching until whatever ailed him is gone. He draws a breath, shudders, and speaks. Mom said my father was a man. I didn't get to know him, but she always, always made it clear. So don't get the wrong idea. Again, no way it was a bull. That makes no sense. And if he was someone like me, he'd have gotten you a charm. Unless something happened to him, or he doesn't know you exist. The Minotaur doesn't like the sharpness in the bird's voice, shrill and teetering on the edge of anger. But he breathes the first sigh of true relief in his life, knowing that there is someone in this world who doesn't think he's the product of bestiality. Perhaps there's wetness in the Minotaur's eyes, glimmering with the fire, but the sharp-eyed peacock mistakes it for something else. Sorry for interrupting. Continue. Well, yeah, what was I saying? You didn't know your dad. Mom raised you, I assume? <laughs> yeah, raised me and my six siblings. I'm the youngest one, and well, she couldn't have any more after I uh, got out. Oh, jeez, that cannot be a comfort. Dad, dad, dad. Yeah, that sounds harsh. Ruined is what she said. You ruined me. Not a drop of anger in her voice, although her face was covered in two decades worth of humiliation. She blew smoke on his face, ground the cigarette's butt out on the plastic dining room table, then threw it in the empty fruit bowl. Just stating a plain fact. Inescapable. He shouldn't have been born. Never got along with her, or any of my siblings for that matter. They blamed me for stuff I didn't do began simply enough, blaming him for breaking their one glass cup, the orange one that Ma used to drink coffee. He was four years old. Like an addiction, it took root and grew. If something went missing from the fridge, it was him, or if any misfortune struck, as if his existence brought bad luck, they pointed his horns and refused to say his name. Just him. Nameless, more of a concept than a person, eyes wide open and mind silent, numb as it kept on happening. It became their drug, the reason why they couldn't get their jobs and had to live off of welfare. 
being angry at him was enough to justify beating their girlfriends or abandoning their kids and skipping town. Him. His name was so unused it might as well not exist. Storm was a better title, and so the lad gathers the memories, the pains, the mind unto itself. Everyone thought things about my ma, about what she must have done to have a kid like me. Even looking at me made her angry. School treated me like shit too. So I dropped out and ran away. Thought I could make a living out there in the city or on a farm. Didn't last long. The farm owner could appreciate it. Nope, sorry, wrong voice. Didn't last long. The farm owner could appreciate his strength and hard work, but the farmhands weren't too fond of sharing their living quarters with him. Better to quit the job than get butchered halfway through the night, he thought. But I came back. Couldn't get any luck. People here, at least, don't panic when they see me. Too out of their damn minds to care. Tried going back home to Ma. She let me in, but then she'd wake me up at night to yell. Too out of her damn mind to know what she was doing. So I tried going out again. Didn't work either. Made it farther, but the police started getting curious about the horned homeless man under the bridge. That's why I live here, by the pond. It's safe. No one bothers me at night. I can get some gigs here and there to buy food. It's a pretty miserable existence. That's my story. Is that enough for your ritual? A shiver crawls up the peacock's back. The air around them grows sharper. A migraine slithers over his head and burrows itself into his left eye. His legs go numb and his brain finds itself forgetting words. The minotaur, meanwhile, looks away from the fire. The light sears his eyes. The hummingbirds peck at his neck again while chanting cicadas take over his hearing. He's about to ask for help when, in a flash, it's all over. Yes, this is enough. Let's see now. A feather. This one's about to fall off. I'll say the oath now. Just accept it. The peacock closes his eyes. His feathers stand on end, as if a shiver runs up his spine. You are the salt of the earth, eternal and unrelenting. Why, then, should you not be your sibling? You are the night's moon, a city buried in ash. A secret written on your chest cannot be seen. You are the salt of the earth, and what is humanity without you? Hidden, you shall not lose your worth. You shall not be trampled underfoot. You shall not die again. Blessed are you when you become our sibling. By the gift of humanity, none shall persecute you. Neither will they accuse you of unsightly deeds. You are the light of the world, hidden from sight and shining regardless. They'll not see your origin, but will bask in your gift. You'll not be set apart, and glory will follow your footsteps by salt and sea. Take my life thread. Let us swear an oath of kinship. May humanity afford the bearer of this promised protection in its bosom, much like we have tonight swapped our long-lasting threads. You shall feast and live as one of our own, bearer of kinship, and for as long as you carry the proof of this oath, none shall see your myth. By salt and sea, by the western lands, untie my bundle of humanity and stretch its thread to this one, so he may enjoy freedom no lesser than mine. Bearer of humanity, do you pledge this honest oath to mankind for as long as your chest draws breath? This must be a dream, thinks the Minotaur, or a demon at work. And just what could be the inevitable catch? A gift like this does not come without a gut-wrenching price. But none of it matters. Consequences be damned, he will take it. I do. Throw the feather and your object on the flame. My gift will burn, so yours shall not. The hybrid takes out his ear gauge, puts the feather through it, and pushes both into the fire. There, try it on. Welcome to your first night as a human, Storm. Ah, but we never do get to see what they look like as humans, do we? They're all just mythical creatures. <laughs> Monday. 
Sunlight peeks out from the horizon and breaks into a sprint to touch the hotel's outer walls. And we're back home again with our boy with his beautiful gold laurel. The Minotaur sits on the sofa while checking the list of guests. He slides his hooves on the hardwood floor. He scratches his cheek, then looks off to the jelly purple sky beyond the window. You prepare breakfast. The apartment has been taken over by the smell of coffee and dawn. While you peel the boiled eggs, he looks up to you. Gaze held, face motionless. Then returns to his papers. Uh, hum or encourage? Listen, with as much time as we've been spending together, I feel as if I'm compelled to encourage him. I can feel we're going to have a great time today. We'll get a sizable batch of guests, I bet. I must make sure that the reception is always manned. They could arrive at any moment. Want me to call Kota or Luke for it? Or I can do it myself, too. There is no need. I can manage it today. <laughs> Good. First thing they'll be met with is the Cretan Prince's magnanimous hospitality. Let them see the truth with their own eyes. <laughs> How kind of you to have such high hopes for this clumsy bull. If I didn't know any better, I would guess you are making a joke at my expense, my lord. Not a joke, partner. Just the truth. They may not know you're THE Minotaur, but if you ask me... I'd leave this place doubting that Athenian legend. Uh, if only my story was as hopeful as you are. Our stories are one and the same, buddy, so you better get used to some hope. We're in this together, right? Asterion chuckles. I suppose I am contractually obligated to agree with you. I'll take it. Now come here, you clumsy bull. It's time for breakfast. While sharing a meal with the Minotaur, you continue going over all that needs to be done. What do we have on our agenda today? Nothing out of the ordinary. Asterion takes a boiled egg, dabs, dabs it on the pile of salt on his plate, and eats it whole. So far, your mandate has been very eventful, has it not? Every day something new, if not bickering guests, then foreman this, internet that. But those days are meant to be the exception. Ever since the hotel was created, the life of a master has been very peaceful and contemplative. Very soon you'll see that even the Argos, whom you must think is a constant fixture of the realm, in truth is only a rare, if potentially brutal, hindrance. It is the same every time. Along with a new master, a fresh foreman appears to stir trouble for a while. Similar to his predecessors, but each one unique and peculiar in his own way. But they never stay for long. One day they all slither back into the recesses of the valley and disappear. After that, you'll find a solid routine. Day in, day out, business as usual. Huh. The Argos is rare? What exactly do you mean when you say the Argos is rare? Oh, I suppose you would have no way of knowing it. For many centuries, perhaps a thousand years if I recall correctly, there was no Argos. In fact, the first one only appeared about two thousand years ago, a few decades after I began working on what would become the hotel. Huh. I've long held the suspicion that the Labyrinth must have created the first Argos in response to the Masters becoming more lenient. I suppose even the labyrinth, unmoving and stagnant as it is, can change and adapt to new circumstances. That's not what I was expecting. The Minotaur breathes in and prepares to speak again, but his eyes fall upon the armband peeking from your shirt sleeve. His, ear flicks, his ears flick once, then grow still as he ruminates and picks his words. But you should not worry about the Argos. It should not be for too much longer that he will pose any threat. Ahead of you, there is only your peaceful reign and gentle lordship. Thoughtful, trusty, straight. I don't know that there's too much straight about this lordship. <laughs> Can't say I'd be opposed to that. I wasn't expecting any of this when I... when I stumbled into owning a hotel. It is understandable, but what did you expect, master? Once more, he looks at the armband on your bicep. Forgive me. What did you expect when you came here, Rukari? I was betting the deed would be an old piece of scrap paper, nothing more. I couldn't believe I'd received ownership of a hotel or anything of the sort, just like that. But as surprising as it may have been, I can't say it was unwelcome. So you are enjoying your time here, I take it? 
I'd have left already if I wasn't. The company is good. Nay, hey, that made him happy. I see. Your meal is brief. It's about time to start working. After washing the dishes, Asterion takes you to another room on the hotel's ground floor. Oh, I got an office! This is snazzy! Now that we have no pressing tasks hanging over our heads, allow me to introduce you to your office, master. You mean our office, partner? Yes, pardon me. Our office. Business partners. Together like horn and skull. The Minotaur's ears flick back and forth. He runs a finger over the back of his neck, tidying the fur even as it stands on end. With a shake of the head and a snort, he looks to the office. Here is where you will plan ahead for the tasks each staff member will be assigned for the day. You mean sending them to explore the valley and work on contracts? Not exactly. Assembling exploration parties to the valley is unusual, but as long as they are cautious, and I am not present among them, there shouldn't be much of an issue with continuing to do so. As much as you may insist on elevating me to being your business partner, this call falls to you. It is your right and duty to manage the hotel staff. You may assign them tasks, or allow them some time off to enjoy themselves. Do keep in mind, however, that we all have a number of daily obligations. It is not every day that we will have time for exceptional, exceptional tasks, such as research or exploration, but when we do... Asterion grabs a notebook from the table and flips through the pages. They are covered in notes and schematics written in bright purple ink. We could go over Miss Greta's notes and see if she left any good ideas for us. Reasonable. Well, time to get to work then. Indeed. I'm going out to the reception now, but... Before I go, how does your arm feel? Is the armband causing any discomfort? No, no, not at all. I can't even feel it most of the time. It's almost like it isn't there. I'd go so far as to say it's nearly incorporeal. I only ever remember it's there when I look at the beer. Is this actually made of lead? Should I worry about heavy metal poisoning? <laughs> that should not be a concern. I am relieved to hear it does not discomfort you. It was never my intention to... Don't worry about it. This is nothing. You do not have to pretend, my lord. I mean, Rukari. It was unbecoming of me to have proposed the idea, and far too proud of me to let you go on with it. No, there's no reason for that, Asterion. I'm telling you exactly how it is. This armband is nothing, and even if it was, it's the least I can do. Now, let's get to work and have a nice day, shall we? You are a very peculiar master, Rukari, but in no way unpleasant. I shall see you later, then. See ya. Okay, I have a daily agenda tutorial. We're finally getting into the hotel management stuff, so daily agenda. You now have full control over your daily activities. On top of managing the R&D and exploration teams, you can now choose how you spend your time on the daily agenda screen. The left side of the screen, one over here shows your current team. Click on the Manage Teams buttons to manage R&D and exploration as usual. The middle of the screen, too, shows a list of daily tasks you, you can perform, such as working on side projects or spending time with your staff. Click on these and your current plan for the day will be set. You can also customize Asterion's appearance by clicking on the Customize Asterion button on the top right or look at Pending R&D Projects by clicking on the Pending Projects button. There's a lot of stuff to this. The bottom of the screen, 5, shows your current plan for the day. You can change it by selecting a different activity or clicking the Cancel Plan button. When your plan is finished, click the Confirm Plan button to continue. You will perform your daily activities and meet up with your teams at the end of the day. Okay, Staff Route Tutorial. You can now choose to spend time with your staff members if they are available giving it during a given day. Spending time with a character will help him work through his issues or give more insight on him. As a result of this personal growth, the character's stats can improve over time. You can see each character's route progress in the Guests menu. Oh, this has gotten a lot deeper and more in-depth than I thought. We're gonna be in this game a while. Keep in mind that if the character is assigned either to either the R&D or Exploration teams, he will be dismissed for the day to make time for you. It's up to you to balance a character's personal development with its contributions to R&D and exploration. As of this build, routes are a work in progress, with only Kota and Kenbish's being complete. You may get a message on the character select screen informing you that you can't currently advance a character's route past this point. Wait, does that mean that Asteria's route isn't complete? That's like the one thing I was going for! I don't even know who Kenbish is! Okay. 
You can see these tutorials that you find for help I need. I was my listen, buddy, pal. I was very much looking forward to. That's not what I wanted. Uh, I can't do suspenders and modern shirt. Okay, fine. I wanted to do the 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 the. I wanted to do his route, my boy, with his little loin, with his little uh, kerchief. Don't want to do just suspenders. We appreciate him fully clothed. Can I do jeans with the shirt though? Uh, I guess I can't. I just, I just wanted to do jeans with the, the 40s outfit. Let's give him the 40s outfit. He looks classy. Keep the armband on. Always white fur because that's his original color. Dang though, that's unfortunate. Okay, manage teams. I don't know that we necessarily need to do a ton of surveying. I mean, the surveying though does... Uh, surveying does get me stuff about his past. It's really too dangerous to have... Have him go alone though, I feel like. Well, for the surveying. Okay. I, I feel like we can do this... I mean, I could just hang out with Luke and Coda and get to know them a little better, but... Uh, I don't really have any pending projects. If I can get my tech, I can get a mythical gym, a swimming pool, a poolside bar... And these things are not available. I do need to get the swimming pool for the poolside bar. Okay, so it would make sense to work on getting some contract stuff done. We could get a pool. A pool would be nice. But if I if I want to hang out with these two, uh, if I hang out with Luke, and Kota, dang it, Asterion's next scenes are not available for this build. Crap. Well, let's just let's just do a little bit of uh, work. Take the day off and rest until the afternoon. Check in on the R&D team. We made some progress, but no projects were completed. Did we find anything interesting? Exploration team. Didn't find any raw materials. Found something else. An old page turned off a book. A small memento of Asterion's past. Great. That's something. Later that night, the guests were enraptured by Coda and Luke's tales about the Forbidden Valley and its odd creatures. All of Asterion's unsightly connections to it were omitted, leaving space for exor exhortations of his and your talent as leaders. Neither did they mention Clement's betrayal, the expulsion of the former guests, the Basaf's unknown fates, or Asterion's regrettable one. You and the Minotaur listened to it all from your table in the corner of the lounge. The guests' captivated gazes, so fixed they became heavy, were not altogether unpleasant. The thus a day came and passed. Sweet Mother Night and her son sleep embrace the land and all its dwellers. But dawn slithers its way in, as it has since time immemorial. Rise now, my lord, and live again. Interesting. Unfortunate. Okay. So. Realistically. I might as well, since I it's my only option, get to know Coda a little bit. Maybe I can help him find his person. So I'll hang out with Coda. I don't really have anyone else to hang out with. And Asterion and Luke can do some research and stuff. That seems like fun. We'll spend a day with Coda. Yeah, I'm done planning. During his downtime, when he wasn't puttering around the lounge, or down in the bedrock, or out in the valley, Coda tended to keep to himself. In such moments, the dragon could often be found resting in a large armchair by the hearth. His brows would furrow in thought, and his mouth would pull down into a tiny frown as he'd stare deep into the dancing flames, almost meditative, or perhaps lost in reminiscence. Coda? Ah, Rukari, good afternoon. Forgive me, can I get you anything? There's still leftovers from lunch I can put together for you. No, no, it's fine. I actually wanted to talk with you a little now that things have settled down. Oh? He gestures, and you take his invitation to sit in the chair across from him. Yes. I realize that despite our time together, I don't really know all that much about you. 
I mean, I know you've been around a long time and have been traveling all over the place, but I'm curious. What's your story? Ah, so you wish to know this old vagrant's tale, hmm? It's quite a long and meandering one, I'm afraid, and... He glances at the clock on the wall. I'll have to start getting dinner ready soon. More guests coming in means more work to feed them all, and the meal I have in mind will take some preparation beforehand. However, if you're curious, I don't mind at all indulging you for the time being. What would you like to know? Well, for starters, what were you doing before you came here? Asterion told me you were in a pretty bad state when you arrived. Did you really walk through the desert to get here? Oh, that. I was quite taken aback by the sudden change in locale, let me tell you. But if you're concerned about my well-being, please don't be. I may be older than, my, than any human alive, but I'm still hale and hearty. I found myself traveling by foot often enough over the years that I'm very much used to it. As for my circumstances before arriving, I've been staying for a time in a little town in the Pacific Northwest of America. There are many beautiful places there, all over the world if one knows where to look, almost as beautiful as the land of my birth back when I was much younger. In any case, I'd actually struck a deal very similar to our arrangement with the owners of one of the stores in town, a little mom-and-pop hiking supplies outpost. In exchange for a place to sleep and the occasional meal, I would provide whatever services they'd require. Huh. Uh, don't take it the wrong way, but you don't really seem to tie, but hiking supplies... Well, how was it? And how was it? Considering that, considering what you just said about traveling on foot, you probably had a good amount of experience to bring to the table. Oh yes, back in Japan when I was younger, putting on a good pair of sandals and walking was the only way you could get to many places. Even back then, the price for transport was quite steep, but a sturdy walking stick, a well-made pack, and your own two feet could be just as good as a horse for those without means. Well, I bet they were had to, glad to have someone working who knows his stuff. It did help somewhat, and it wasn't the first time I've played at being a merchant, so not to toot my own horn, but I was able to make a few decent sales for them. I quite enjoyed my time there, truth be told. I enjoyed working for that wonderful couple, and I enjoyed making sure the clientele left happy. That, I suppose, is the one good part of my wandering. Being among humans. Participating in their lives, their joys, their triumphs, offering what little blessings I can give, or helping them to find their own. I suppose you could say that is my true calling in life, my reason for being. The one good part? I'm probably digging somewhere I shouldn't, but... Well... A journey by oneself often carries with it the burden of loneliness. All along this road, not a single soul, only autumn evening. Just when the silence becomes stifling, just when you open your mouth to break it, the dragon glances over your shoulder towards the bar. Ah, forgive me for cutting things short. I do believe it's about time I started getting dinner ready. He hops to his feet, brushing his clothes into pristine neatness, and then gives you a small, polite nod. I enjoyed conversing with you like this, Rukari. We will really should do it again sometime. Sure, if the schedule allows, I'd be happy to talk with you more, Coda. Until then, I guess I'll see you later. With another nod and a serene smile, Coda makes his way towards the kitchen. You rise to your feet, as well, stretch, and head off to finish today's work. We're talking in haikus now, damn it! Our R&D team is still just working, but not completing things because we need a lot of stuff and we didn't explore today. After sunset, Asterion went off to the rooftop. He did not outright say it, but he required privacy to ruminate on the contract you'd, on the contract you'd signed a few nights before. You provided him with all the alone time he required. Later, you found Luke by the hearth, chatting with a haggard bunch of guests about his personal misadventures. 
Their clothes had seen better days. None of them shared a language or origin. All grasped cups overflowing with sweet beverages in their shaking hands. Unshackled by the laws of the outside world, Luke evangelized about the mythical beings, their tales, and magic. The guests tightened their grip on their mugs. Magic, fantasy, and the hearth kindled their wary hearts. Food and drink healed their bodies. And Luke's unyielding, screeching laughter, as unpleasant as it sounded, planted within them a dream of prosperity, dignity, and bounty. That's nice. And we're back to work the next day, hanging out with Luke and Kota. And I think we're going to call it here for this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. It looks like we're finally going to get to the hotel management side of things, at least. And we're going to get to spend some more time with Luke and Kota. And hopefully, one day, we will get to spend more time with my sweet baby boy. Because I just... He's precious, and I want him to be happy in life, and we're going to fix this somehow, but that's not going to be this episode. So for now, I thank you guys so much for watching. If you like the video, maybe like it. I appreciate it. It just lets me know that you're enjoying what I'm watching. If you want to stick around, subscribe. We're getting back into the swing of things with more frequent episodes, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye!